Well, thanks again for your patience as we got set up for this. Um, Commissioner Curry, thanks again for coming and being a part of this. This is, um, you know, you have been to India and worked in India um, and with your work uh, with Open Doors. Um, how have conditions changed in the past few years as you've looked at India? Well, we, when we measure uh, the persecution of Christian groups within India, we see a sharp rise uh, since the election of Prime Minister Modi and the ascension of his political party. And what you, what you essentially see is this, in, uh, I, I would call it in informal terms, an encouragement to, to people who are on the fringes, who are in extremist groups, and who really want to take a country which is massively diverse, not just religiously, but politically diverse, uh, culturally diverse, the languages are diverse, the currency, there's lots of different... In many ways, India is, is more than just one country. There's, it's a, there's a lot to that country. And you have, a since 2014, a nationalistic agenda of its political leaders to encourage a, a kind of a, a forming behind one particular religion and one particular way of seeing the world. And w who benefits from that? It's, it's these political leaders. Mm -hmm. So they're stoking this. They're allowing it to come up. And obviously, Muslims and Christians are the two largest groups that are targeted in this case. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's what we've seen, is this, this massive rise in violence which, and, and uh, vigilantism uh, uh, and uh, all of the things that were detailed earlier uh, as a political agenda. And it's, it's discouraging. But I think the good news is that we know, we, what we know about India, its people, that is good, is that you, have, you, have, you do have a democracy. We have to continue to try to, 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 in that system, put pressure on the businesses that choose to do business with a government like this. You saw recently that Apple decided, hey, we're no longer going to, to build our phones in China. Mm -hmm. And they're looking around saying, where can we do that? I find it interesting that they didn't do, uh, d did not decide to go to India. Why do you suppose that is? Because the business community is, uh, the, uh, and the Indian uh, expat community are beginning to hear the message that this political agenda against Muslims, Christians, and other religious minorities is not acceptable. It's not going to be accepted. The people here and others are not going to stop talking about it. So, yes, there's been a big rise, and I now think you're seeing the counter insurgency of, of people of, t of religious faith uh, and, and, and who want to have shared values with such an important partner in the international community. But you've got to say something. You have to challenge it when it happens, when there's these human rights violations. So I do see a big trend uh, uh, that's happened since 2014, but now it's time to start another trend. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so the day after tomorrow, um, December 9th, is the International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide. And as you, you heard earlier, Dr. Stanton was talking about the 1948 Genocide Conven Convention. So when you look at the convention and you look at all the atrocity prevention programs we have, all the talks about never again in preventing genocide, and you look at India, what do you think? I mean, what goes through your mind? Well. I mean, I appreciated Dr. Stanton's comments because there is a kind of a futility uh, when, when we're waiting for a genocide to happen and then sometimes months, years later decide, like, hey, that happened, and yet nobody wants it to, to kind of create a system where we can stop it from happening. What it fundamentally takes is political courage of our leaders and you would, you know, it's in some ways easier for these folks to stand up and call out a rogue nation because there's, everybody knows where you stand on rogue nations. But what about, what about an important political partner? What about an important international business partner uh, that wants, you want to have access to those markets and they want to have a, a connection with you and everybody benefits? but you don't share the value, uh, uh, the human rights value of religious freedom. You must have the political courage to challenge them. And I think 
if you do so, most of the time you'll find uh, ways to move forward. So that's, that's the initial step. We need leaders of conscience and courage who will stand up and challenge India, their, their government, uh, and, and be strong on this. But it's ineffectual now, as, as Dr. Stanton pu pushed out, to say after the fact, here's all these things that are happening. Right, and, and you make some really good points. And, you know, so we, a lot of uh, the excuses, India is an important ally. But when you look at the countries of particular concern, for instance, you see that Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are, are, have been designated as countries of particular concern. What is it about India that, that they have this double standard, the U.S. government, in, in terms of how they treat India? Well, I think part of it is the, the power of their political lobby in this, in this city. Mm -hmm. We have to be, keep it real that, uh, that they're spending a lot of money here. They're spending a lot of time uh, uh, demonizing anybody who speaks out on these subjects. And so it's, it's a ripple effect of fear amongst the political class. And fortunately, a lot of, a lot of us don't have anything to lose in that regard because uh, we're already scoundrels in some way or another. But, <laughs> but uh, so you have, you, 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 I think what you see is that they have a very sophisticated uh, plan to, to, to address this and, and they'll spend the money to do it. I also think that the message, we have to understand that the Indian community is loved and appreciated in this country. Mm -hmm. And we have a perspective on India which is which is overwhelmingly positive and so we have to we as as advocates and 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 those who are explaining it have to say that like look we we understand the values and the and the the cultural importance of the indian people but but this point is not is not separate from that it has to be addressed we need the indian government to stop encouraging targeting of, of, of religious minorities. So uh, we've got to get that message out. It's not a denigration on the, the Indian culture. It is, it is a political environment now that is being encouraged. And in some ways you could say that the Indian uh, population that's voting for this are being very skillfully manipulated uh, to, to see these religious uh, s subgroups as part of the problem instead of part of the community uh, part, part of the community of India that you're not really an Indian citizen if you're a Christian or a Muslim that you have to be Hindu which is entirely backwards to the way uh, you know they, they've you know s seen their value rise in the past right and so why should members of Congress why should the American people be concerned about the conditions in India and um, the, the atrocities we're seeing, the crimes against religious minorities, why, why should this be a, a, a concern? I, I always make the case that religious freedom violations are the, is the canary in the coal mine. When you see people who are now not able to practice their faith or not decide to choose their faith, this is the beginning of these internecine wars that tip over into larger chaos. Mm -hmm. And when you have such a diverse country as India, with so many different communities and faiths and languages, you're now setting up this tribal kind of battle that's going to happen within that country that can and probably will, if this continues, escalate. So now you would then have an international, important international partner with a massive population and tons of resources and wealth and, and value to the world beyond that culturally that will be caught up and fighting each other and destroying each other. It's happened over and over and over again uh, throughout history where you see, well, we don't like these people and don't worry about it. Don't worry, this is inside our borders. And they just start picking and it bleeds over into the larger uh, community. And then you have a massive international crisis. You, you have it in other countries, which I won't highlight right now, but I think that's the worst case scenario for India. The, the midterm or short term scenario is that people lose confidence in the Indian government's ability to keep their promises because we, we believe that India is an important partner. Everybody would say, yes, they'd nod their heads. Well, what is that based on? It's based on trust. Do you have the same agenda? Do you have the same values? And then all the cultural differences then add value. But if you don't know what truth is, if you don't know what right and wrong is as it relates to human rights, 
on what basis is any agreement you make. It, it, right. The whole system breaks down. It does, which leads us to this, um, the State Department's recent announcement of their countries of particular concern and the fact that they um, left off India, even though India so clearly meets um, the criteria for a country of particular concern. I know you sort of had really strong words, I think used outrage. Chair Nuri Turkel had some strong statements. So how frustrating it is for you to watch this? And, you know, why is it important that India be listed as a country of particular concern? Well, as I said in my talk, it does not honor and uh, the law that was set. The, the pattern should be that we could probably imagine that there are scenarios by which a country would need a waiver if there's some sort of nas greater national security. The proper process should be that the State Department, which recognizes what's happening, would make them a country of particular concern and then for some reason give them a waiver on business or whatever. That's not what happened. It was a bald-faced political maneuver to ignore what's happening in India. That's why it's so shameful. Uh, and I think people inside the State Department, my suspicion is they know uh, what, a, what a misstep this is, and we have to keep the pressure on. Right. I always felt like, um, you know, once I joined USERF and understood that we have a, a you know, the, the beauty of, of the U.S. Commission is you really are single focused on religious freedom. So we're, we're, you know, USERF is not to decide, not to consider the geopolitical ramifications of what you're doing, but to call a spade a spade. And, to, and that's the State Department's job. But I really feel like um, I, I try to explain this to, to both the Republicans when, it, when, I, when it was under the Trump administration and now under Biden that it's, it's not personal, it's, it's not against the administration, it's more of we're, we're, we're standing strong um, f against um, human rights violations, religious freedom violations. And by doing that, it's actually giving cover to the administration so they can actually sit at the table with those countries and say, boy, we're getting a whole lot of, of pressure. Um, why are, is this happening? Can, you, you need to change this. And so actually what happens is when we speak out is, is it helps the administration to be able to be stronger with these countries. So, so it's, it really depends on how you, how you look at it. But I found that to be the case and in my interactions with, with officials at the State Department. Um, as harsh as I've been on, on several of the countries I've been working on, I almost always get a high five. You know, so it's not like a please stop talking about it because they're in a very difficult situation. They're trying to thread a lot of needles at the same time. And um, human rights and religious freedom can so often be pushed aside, but we know that there can't be p the kind of peace that, that will bring prosperity and that is better for the U.S. In, unless these, these conditions continue sure. Um, for sure. And so I really appreciate your service that you serve in continuing um, that tradition of speaking the truth, um, regardless of, of how it may fit into the U.S. agenda, um, because that's, that's so important that we continue to do that. Um, we have over here some of the prisoners of conscience here, and I just want to mention that USERF has done just a wonderful job um, uh, highlighting prisoners and um, has the Forbes list um, now that keeps track of all the different prisoners. And you mentioned, I know, even the prisoners in your own remarks. You know, what can USERF do to bring more attention to these? What can Congress do to bring more attention to the actual people that are the victims of the, this, this ideology that, that um, um, is, is taking away the rights of people in addition to the crimes we're also seeing people imprisoned? Yeah, the, the great thing about recognizing some of these lives here and, and, and promoting these stories through our various platforms is that it humanizes what could just be sort of a top-line political discussion. This affects real people. We were talking earlier today. Mm -hmm. Some people go through this kind of imprisonment and, and, and difficulty, and they're broken. Mm -hmm. It breaks their life. They're never the same. And uh, when you see how it affects real people, you, then you come back to say, that's why it's important we, we, we share these stories, because it has an impact on policy, uh, one individual life can inspire a policymaker, a congressman, a senator to take this on, and their voice uh, is amplified. So it's really important that we know who these uh, uh, people are, that we share the stories, because the population, where, you know, politics is downstream of what everybody's caring about. So if we let people know and they care, then the policymakers will get motivated, I hope. Absolutely. Well, and thank you. And I do want to just say that, you know, we stand with the people of India. When we talk about India, we're really talking about the government and the choices that are being made that actually are taking freedom away from people 
they're not being able to practice their faith, be able to follow their conscience, be able to live the life that, that they want to live, that they feel called to live. So, you know, we, we love India. I've been to India. I, I hope to go again, and, and I want nothing more than, than peace and, and prosperity for the people of India. But we know that this trajectory is, is going to lead to the opposite um, for India and, and for the people that live there. So we're, we appreciate your work so much, Thank Commissioner. Thank you. Thanks for what you do.